Uh, thank you, Lucas, for that introduction, and thank you to the LID Student Conference Organizing Committee for inviting me here today. I'm excited to talk about some of our more recent work in improving interactions among semi-cooperative robots. So I'm going to get started with a little bit of motivation of some of the things that have gotten me excited about studying interactions in multi-agent systems. And uh, actually, something that I find a lot of inspiration from is uh, nature. And I really like how, if we look to biology, if we look to different systems, we see these really complex interactions. Uh, and this is a video, so if you're a fan of the Blue Planet 2 series on BBC, this is seals hunting tuna in the Galapagos. Now, in the open water, the tuna are much faster than the seals, so they can outmaneuver the seals and get away. And so what the seals have learned to do is actually herd the tuna into these shallows, into these tide pools, where then they're more agile and can maneuver around. And as a team, they coordinate together to capture um, their tuna and have, have themselves a tasty dinner. And this is a system here where we've got complex behaviors, complex interactions, teamwork, and they're doing it without supercomputers. They're doing it without communication radios. And I look at this and I wonder, what does it take to get our robot systems to be this dynamic, uh, to be this flexible in their interactions? And across nature, we see a lot of different examples of these collaborative systems, of these different types of cooperations that scale up to really, really complex behavior from perhaps simple, um, you know, simple behaviors. And so how do we get robots to exhibit that same kind of complex and rich behavior? And I'll, I'll kind of take a step back before we get to, to some of the topics I have for today and say that this idea of looking to nature, um, looking to biology for our uh, robotic inspiration is, is not new to the field. Uh, we've been doing it for a number of years. And let's take for the example, bio-inspired robotic herding. Um, some of the earliest work in bio-inspired robotic herding actually came from Richard Vaughn's PhD thesis in Oxford in the late 90s. And this is a really, I, I think, a really cool system where they were working to see if they could get a robot to herd ducks around this arena. And a lot of advancements in computer vision, in the ability to detect where these ducks are and look at flocking dynamics to get them to maneuver around. And so within the system, you take this model from biology, you take something like a flocking model that has some attraction and repulsion against the agents. And then you can start to build upon it. Some of my PhD work looked at uh, how we could do this with multiple agents. Um, one sec. Is that there? OK. And we can exploit geometric properties to then take advantage of these flocking dynamics and get them to drive to new locations. And while this is very exciting to show at a robotics conference, this right here looks nothing like the nuanced and rich behavior that we see in nature. So we can take these mathematical models to a certain extent, but maybe we're not getting the full emergent behavior that we'd like to see um, out of our, our natural counterparts. And similarly, I've spent a lot of time thinking about pursuer evader games. And again, you can do this nice mathematical derivation where you can guarantee capture of all of your evaders uh, using geometric uh, properties about Voronoi cells. But this is all conditioned on the idea that everyone in the group is playing by the same set of rules. And what I really want to think about is that, you know, as we expand our robotic systems, as we move away from just equations on a page to really complex interactions, how do we then create more rich behavior? What sort of tools do we need to get this complex behavior? And it's really that model of the behavior that we have within the system that's going to drive our ability to define these rich, complex interactions. And so instead of thinking of our robot teams as either being all cooperative and equal in performance or having maybe I clearly identified malicious agents, what's that in between? What are all those different types of interactions we can have due to performance variations, uncertainty in our system, 
non-cooperative teammates and human teammates as well. So that's kind of a background. That's what I like to think about uh, a lot of the, the big questions that I start my research with. And I would say that within the robotics community right now, uh, I like to think about the different ways we can model behavior for our multi-robot systems with maybe three approaches. We have geometric tools. These are things like Voronoi cells, uh, reciprocal velocity obstacles, control barrier functions that take physical properties of the world and distill it down into fast and easy constraints that we can apply. We have interactive models, so things like game theoretic models, optimization techniques that start to give us more um, nuanced interactions. And then, of course, we have those learned models, those that come from training on large data sets that give us perhaps the closest to the true nuanced emergent behavior, but of course that requires data of a particular domain. And so it's not that any of these approaches is like the best approach. Uh, and likely we need a combination of all of these approaches to create our most complex systems. But within this talk, I'm going to focus more on the things I'm thinking about with both geometric and interactive tools and focus less on how we can model behavior through, through learned, learned systems. And so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm excited to share these are all newer results coming out of our lab. And in fact, uh, I'll highlight we've recently had three papers accepted to ICRA, so very new results <laughs> that we're looking at. So a lot of this stuff is not yet a completely solved problem. A lot of this is we're just getting started on some of these research threads and we're starting to think about where we can take this, where we can push this um, as we think about modeling new types of cooperation, new types of interactions. And each of these is going to require different tools and how, uh, what I hope to talk about today is how the approach that we use, how the tools that we use to analyze the problem will give us different behaviors in the system. So I'll first talk about some of our recent work on how we can scale up stochastic dynamic games to multiple agent interactions to really taking it towards cluttered environments out of these maybe two or three player games. Next, I'll talk about some of our work looking at how we can gather information in risky situations. And this is where we're starting to look at tools from uh, Pareto optimization, looking at multi-objective optimization to get agents to trade off between different competing objectives in a game. And finally, I'll look at some geometric tools uh, as how we can have heterogeneous multi-robot teams perform resource delivery in decentralized fashions. And so first, uh, this is talking about some of our work in scaling up stochastic dynamic games. And so when we're talking about stochastic dynamic games, what we're talking about is you have a system of agents and each agent is going to have uncertainty about both the world that it's in, as well as the uncertainty about the other agents and what those other agents are doing. And we start by asking, how do we reason about the beliefs of other agents? So not only do we have our uncertainty about ourselves and their positions, but then how can we start to think about what the other agent is thinking about? So the I think that you think that I think that you think, and can we turn that into an interactive game that the, the agents can play. And so this was work uh, actually started here at MIT, led by Wilco Schrotting. Um, and we published this paper now two years, uh, two, three years ago in TRO, Stochastic Dynamic Games and Belief Space, where we took belief space planning, that notion of how certain am I about myself and the environment, and combined it with game theory. So how do my actions influence the actions of others to create a game theoretic belief space ILQG problem. And what we were excited about with these results is that we saw that hiding, revealing, and seeking information influences the other agent's actions and their uncertainty. So not only can we take these game theoretic interactions, but we can also use it to maybe manipulate or influence how the other agent perceives the world. And by influencing that, we can influence their future strategies. We're going to formulate this with Gaussian belief dynamics. Um, and ultimately, we're looking to find the Nash equilibrium of the problem we're setting out. And so to give you an idea of what these games might look like, 
We're going to look first at a couple kind of toy examples um, where we see this combination of a game theoretic strategy plus um, our belief space planning. So in this game, we're going to consider two agents, the blue agent and the orange agent. The blue agent's goal is to gain information about the orange agent. And the orange agent is not cooperative, not malicious, not adversary. It just wants to keep its speed up and not collide with the blue agent or any other obstacles in the environment. And in terms of our uncertainty model, we're going to say that light sources within the environment are going to reduce our uncertainty. So when the agent is under a light source, it can uh, more effectively gather information. So what is the emergent behavior? Well, the emergent behavior then is that the blue agent uses this knowledge that the orange agent is trying to collide and it will herd the orange agent into those light sources such that it can gather the most information about the blue agent. And so we can set up different environments with different patterns and see that we are herding into this. And if you're not taking into consideration those belief dynamics, which is shown in the smaller inset, uh, then the blue agent doesn't herd the orange agent and doesn't effectively gather as much information. All right, so with that kind of example, I'm gonna give a high level overview of the algorithm. I'm not going to go into the weeds on a lot of the math here, although anyone who's interested in talking about that, I'd be happy to talk more over the coffee break, um, as well as can point you to some of the papers on this. So we say we have Gaussian belief dynamics. What that means is we're going to also use an extended Kalman filter to update the dynamics and measurement models that time. This is pretty standard. Uh, that we see in our different robotic systems. And for this game theoretic LQR, we're going to do a forward pass of the algorithm, and that's where we're going to roll out those EKF belief dynamics. We're going to linearize the dynamics, and we're going to quadricize some reward function. And then on the backward pass at every time step in this horizon that we've rolled out, we're going to formulate our Q functions, find this quadratic game, and solve for the Nash equilibrium and propagate those values backwards, and by iterating the forward and backward paths, eventually we'll converge upon the Nash equilibrium strategies, which means that no agent can unilaterally change its strategy without uh, adversely affecting its cost. And under this particular formulation, what's exciting is that we get linear feedback policies and predictions. So we have a linear complexity in the time horizon, which means we can run this stochastic game uh, quickly. Uh, something like 50 hertz in our simulations. So it's really exciting. That means we can think about the uncertainty, we can think about a lot of things, and we can do it quickly. So we can do a lot of replanning and agile maneuvering with our agents. What I'll say to set up the later part of this is, this is linear and feedback, linear complexity in the time horizon. That's really awesome. I haven't told you what the complexity is yet in the number of agents. We'll get there. Um, and we can start to encode more complex games. So here's another example where we have two agents that are in a cooperative game. So we have what we're going to call our guide dog agent, this orange agent that is tethered to our blind agent. And the, the blind agent objective is that it wants to avoid sudden accelerations and by the time it reaches its goal, it needs to have um, enough certainty about its position that it knows it's at its goal location. And it's the job of this guide dog agent to gather the information and reduce the uncertainty of both of their states. And so from this tether, the dog agent is going to move through uh, these light sources, gather information to reduce the uncertainty about the position, leading the, the blind agent to its goal location such that when the blind agent arrives at its goal, it knows where it is. And oops, without that belief space planning, that dog agent would just go straight to the goal, but then the blind agent would arrive without necessarily knowing that it was at the, the goal location. So again, uh, just because it's a game doesn't mean it can't be cooperative, uh, but it's also more fun to talk about competitive games, and we can scale these up to much more complex games. And so the final game that we'll talk about in this example is one of competitive racing. And so in this case, we created a racetrack, we have two cars, 
And both cars want to win the race, so their objectives are to be in the lead and, of course, not collide with the other agents or go off the course. And we're adding, uh, for the sake of measurements, we're adding sections of the track for which it's easier to gather information. So this could be lights on the track where perception is a little bit clearer. It could be physical landmarks. Um, and so along those sections of the track, they can reduce their uncertainty about their state and about others. And then any sort of uh, acceleration or braking and hard steering is going to increase their uncertainty. Um, and over uh, a bunch of different trials with racing, what we found is that we compared our uh, stochastic dynamic game controller against one that just used game theory but didn't employ any belief space, and against one that just used belief space planning but didn't employ the game theoretic um, decision making. And we showed that our controller won 44% more races than one that only used belief space planning and had no game theory. And 33% more races won versus one that was just a game theoretic controller without any of the belief space planning. So the combination of those two together really can help improve the performance. And further, we start to see emergent behaviors uh, come out from the team. So we see these emergent behaviors like cutting and blocking, where the purple agent is going to cut in on that orange agent around a corner of a racetrack, blocking where then the orange agent in turn is going to maneuver and go side to side, which maybe isn't the best strategy purely for making progress along the track, but it keeps the purple agent from that overtaking. And really, these overtaking maneuvers are only possible because they're performing information gathering, they're reducing their uncertainty about their state in such a way that um, they can confidently overtake and pass with knowing that they won't collide. And so this, we think, is, is really exciting. This is starting to get really complex, nuanced behavior of our teams. We're not explicitly programming in cutting uh, heuristics or blocking heuristics. We're not programming those behaviors. And we're also not getting those behaviors because we've collected a bunch of racing data or we've done massive uh, simulations. Um, but what I said is, even though this is really fast for two agents, we've got nice linear complexity in our time horizon, uh, I want to return to the complexity in the number of agents. This is end of the seventh in the number of agents, which is not great when you start to think about a lot of agents in a team. I think I'm maybe pressing something. Sorry about that. Okay, all right. Um, and so some of our more recent work has been looking at how do we scale this up? If, if, our, algorithm is, uh, if our algorithm is n to the seventh, okay, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna set the clicker down. Uh, if our algorithm is n to the seventh in the number of agents, how can we get that to be lower? Because if it's n to the seventh in the number of agents, soon, once you get past about four agents, you're going to need a pretty powerful computer to solve that, or it's just going to turn into a computationally intractable problem. And so we've been looking at two ways in which we can really start to scale this up and improve those performance uh, numbers. And so the first is this idea of asocial agents in the game. In other words, we propose or hypothesize that in these game theoretic interactions, not every agent is important at every point in time. And so what happens if we start to plan selectively and choose with whom we interact with, who's, who we treat as a social agent, who we treat to do, who we uh, negotiate these game theoretic interactions with, and then treat everyone else as asocial, meaning that we have no influence over them and their control policy might be fixed. And in particular, we want a framework that's flexible, right? We don't just want to say a priori, these are dynamic obstacles and these are the only agents that matter because over time, who matters 
might change depending on your objectives, depending on your locations, and depending on what else is going on in the environment. So this was work we recently presented at the IEEE Multi-Robot Symposium um, in December. And what we propose is selective negotiations by adding this ability to toggle whether an agent is social or asocial at different time steps within the game. So social agents are just like the uh, game theory agents we saw in the last few slides. We're going to go ahead and do a full negotiation with them. We're going to think about beliefs, think about their uncertainty, and plan for some Nash equilibrium with them. Asocial agents, on the other hand, we're going to ignore during our negotiation phase and say that for asocial agents, our actions aren't going to influence what they do, meaning that we can just go ahead and skip that iteration down because they'll already be at this predetermined um, best policy for themselves. And we've done it in a framework such that who is social or asocial can change at different points in time, meaning that we have now this design flexibility of we can choose either how many agents we cooperate with based on proximity, based on objective, or based on other things that are happening in the environment. Trivially, of course, these asocial agents can introduce dynamic obstacles seamlessly into the framework. And so what this means is that if we have dynamic obstacles in the environment that the agents must always avoid, we shouldn't try and negotiate with these obstacles because we're not going to change their trajectory. And so in this case, we have uh, agent one and agent two that need to move from their initial locations to their goal locations, gather some information, and reduce their uncertainty. And so the green and red agents are only going to negotiate their paths and iterate on those best paths with themselves. And then they'll treat those black obstacles as asocial agents. And here we have that light source moving, so there's some interactiveness. Uh, and so what we're doing, returning to this algorithm, is that when we're looking at that Q function, this isn't just an arbitrary minimum that we're setting out. Uh, for, a, for those asocial agents, we can actually show that fixing their policy and fixing that is as if they were already at their optimal policy. Um, and so what that means is that in this backward pass of the algorithm, for those social agents, we're still going to formulate their Q functions. We're going to solve those quadratic approximations with those Bellman equations. And then we can change that social asocial assignment down to even the individual time step. So we can actually change who we're negotiating with quickly um, and at a, at a very granular level with this. And we can show that this doesn't disrupt the ability to find the Nash equilibrium of any of our other agents. And in terms of that problem complexity, what it does is it takes that n to the seventh complexity in the number of agents, which is the dominant runtime of our algorithm, and it brings it down to n to the sixth, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's only among the social agents. And so this can have quite a large impact depending on the different games you're looking at. And so, here what we've got is one example where we look on the left and we're looking at this red agent negotiating with the green agents who are doing this position swap the red agent needs to navigate through them. And in this case, all three agents are performing full negotiations at all points in time. But if we knew something about this problem ahead of time and we knew something about this problem structure, we might say that actually, when the red agent is on two legs of this triangle pattern, it is not going to interact with the green agents at all. And so instead, what if it only interacts with the green agents when it needs to cross their paths? And so from the perspective of the red agent in this case, we can actually decrease the runtime by 38% uh, in, in running these iterations. And this is by exploiting some knowledge about the, the structure of the environment. And further, we can try other heuristics. So maybe it's, you know, teammates 
you know, maybe agents that have priorities. We can look at things like position swap games where we can change who we're negotiating with based on a distance metric. And so in this case, we're considering the perspective of the ego agent as the red agent. And they all need to move along this line and do these position swaps. And uh, what we're plotting on the bottom is the distance that the red agent is from all the other agents in the environment. And at first, we're going to compare as a baseline if we're negotiating with all agents throughout the, the simulation. And then we're going to say, well, what if we only want to negotiate with the two nearest neighbors? How does that improve runtime? And by looking at the two nearest neighbors versus all, all of those neighbors, we can get a 10% decrease in runtime. And if we say, okay, what about just the single neighbor? What if we just look at the nearest neighbor? We can take that down to about a 20 to 25% runtime decrease. And what I want to highlight is this, is that we're doing all of this without sacrificing uh, a major component of the per performance. So in our paper, we discuss more quantitative metrics on the trajectories and control efforts that they're taking, but we're getting these performance increases by choosing these selective negotiations without really impacting the performance. So we're doing this in the way that we can still take advantage of the more intricate or nuanced behavior of this game theoretic design without um, you know, needing to totally sacrifice the behavior. And when we put these side by side, the full planning versus the nearest neighbor, we notice that the behavior that the agents are exhibiting is almost identical. So qualitatively, they're still looking at the same strategies, um, but we're starting to see better runtime performance. And if we have this notion of social versus asocial, we can start to scale this up. Uh, but that's not the only way we can start to think about scaling it up. And the other way that we're starting to think about it is what information is important to propagate. So when we're doing this belief space planning, we're propagating you know, all this uncertainty, all these different states, trying to predict out how that's going to evolve over long stretches of time. But depending on the problem structure, depending on the game, maybe that information, maybe some of that information doesn't actually improve the overall estimates of the behavior, or maybe knowing a piece of information with better certainty than others isn't going to actually change the resultant behavior. So it work that was just accepted this week to ICRA. We'll have a preprint of it on our website soon. It's not there yet. Just want to make a few final edits. Uh, what we're looking at is how can we choose parts of the belief space to propagate and do partial belief space planning in such a way that uh, doesn't impact the behaviors, doesn't impact the performance, but can significantly improve the runtime of the algorithms. And in fact, we're taking this from that complexity of uh, this okay I don't know okay <laughs> all right uh, taking this from that n to the seventh uh, complexity in the number of agents down to n to the fourth um, so a much more significant uh, decrease in the computational complexity of our algorithm and what we're showing in this video is that in the, on the left, we have the full belief space planning, meaning we're propagating the full belief space in our game. And then the middle is we've done some partial belief space planning. So we've chosen parts of it to propagate, other parts we won't. And again, the behavior is very similar. Uh, qualitatively, we're seeing the same types of interactions. Uh, quantitatively, in the paper, we assess this with different metrics on control effort, trajectory length, and things like that. And if we were to compare this to a regular ILQG style planner, what we would see is very different behavior. So we're maintaining the nuanced interactions that we like out of our stochastic dynamic games without moving to a like, completely different uh, type, of, type of behavior. And so 
I'm going to present this in a more graphical argument. Okay, so imagine you, if you were to draw out the covariance matrices or the uncertainties, you could, these are what's shown in the square. And so we have, for all of our agents, we have some uncertainty about the system as well as their state, okay? So if we do full belief space propagation plus those states, you would have that full amount of uncertainty that you would have to propagate. It turns out, if you make assumptions about the independence between agents, you could say, okay, I only want to propagate non-zero beliefs, and you can cut out those cross terms by making assumptions about independence of the agents in the system, right? If you have two independent agents with independent sensors uh, and independent actions, then how agent one senses the world maybe is independent of how agent two senses the world. A uh, fairly common assumption. So one way you can reduce the complexity of your belief space is just to only consider the non-zero beliefs. And then further, you can take it another step and say, all right, let's take the example of these position swap games. In a position swap game, you have both your positions of the agents, but you also have information on velocity, acceleration, orientation, and perhaps other parameters. Uh, maybe knowing things like velocity and acceleration to this game don't matter as much. And so what if they only propagated the beliefs about the position and threw out uh, that uncertainty propagation about acceleration, meaning that uncertainty didn't change over our planning horizon. And for things like a position swap game, uh, in this example, it turns out, if we look at those top three trajectories, they're very similar. Um, we're seeing that this uh, partial belief sp space propagation is, depending on the problem structure, gives us this ability to maintain our behavior and improve our performance without um, sacrificing the resultant behavior of the system. And then if you didn't propagate any uncertainty, uh, just as like a, a check, we see that the red agent does something dramatically different. So it is still important to propagate some of this information. Um, and what, as I said, you know, this is, this is new work, we're just starting to explore it. And so where we see this you know, evolving is how do we then decide what's important or what's not important? So in this case, you know, sharing just the position information was enough to get similar performance to the full planning. But if we think of other games, we probably would want velocity or acceleration information. So how can we start to analyze properties of the game itself, properties of the structure of the environment and the agents to know what we can and can't propagate in our beliefs? How do we identify when agents should be social or social? How do we combine both of these to create an even faster game? And so these are some of the things we're thinking about uh, as we take this project forward. Um, that kind of wraps up one section. So I'm going to maybe see if there are any questions at the moment about this. And if not, I'm gonna move on to the next topic. All right, okay. Yeah, so when we're looking at social and asocial, um, what we mean by social and asocial here is that if I'm iterating and predicting how your behavior changes based on how my behavior changes, so if I have an initial guess of a trajectory, and then I say, if, if this is my policy, how would you change it knowing that I'm gonna do this? For asocial agents, what we're saying is, is they're not going to be influenced by changes to our trajectory. So it's in that piece of the algorithm, we set them as already being at their minimum trajectory, and then we are only planning about that. I'm sorry, can you? Yeah, 
yeah. Uh, I think for this, we've largely looked from the perspective of the individual agents. Um, if all agents were a social and thought they were at their best trajectory or best strategy, um, then uh, it probably wouldn't be the true like optimal solution or or locally minimum solution. So I mean, again, because you're iterating like this, you're always going to move towards the local minimum of the game and not necessarily the global minimum. Um, the more agents that you don't negotiate with, the further away maybe that local minimum is from a global minimum. Is that yeah? Okay. So um, I think. For these next, uh, so this next section, I'm going to talk about in far less detail, looking at the time and making sure that we all get to our coffee break. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about, switching gears quite a bit, is some of the things in which we're thinking about gathering information within risky situations for, for agents. And to set the stage for this question, in distributed and decentralized multi-robot systems, we have all these amazing properties about robustness to individual failures within the team, the ability for a decentralized team to follow and track a target and work together as a team, but a lot of those strategies are not robust to external adversaries or external observation. Meaning that if you take something like three agents who all are trying to track this target and they all follow that, then an adversary just has to go, that's where they're going. I see them, that's where they are. And so what we wanna think about is more broadly, okay, if you know that you're being observed, if you know that uh, there is this chance that you are giving away your strategy, can you take different paths? Uh, it's still working together as a team. Can you do this in such a way that maybe you fool some adversarial observer. And so how do we maintain privacy within our team, privacy of those objectives, when the maneuvers and the motions that we take can be observed by some potential adversary? And we're going to look at this through the lens of multi-objective optimization. And so this is very related to a lot of other work in the field, both from multi-objective planning risk-aware planning, and persistent monitoring. I don't have time to go into all of these papers in detail, but we draw a lot of inspiration from different types of Pareto optimal policies, as well as the different models of risk and information gathering. And so in this environment or in this problem that we're going to set up, but what I'll talk about today is we have this agent, this, this blue agent that needs to gather information through the world. And it has some knowledge of how many targets there are that it needs to go gather information. As it moves close to them, we're going to assume that that information is collected, uh, similar to data harvesting problems, and that there are entities that are risky. And risky in this case means that we're not yet looking at adversaries that are pursuing them or adversaries that are manipulating their behavior. But in other words, if we're detected by these different agents, it could reveal information about our, our strategy. And so we want our agent to go to these different targets of information, gather that information, and when it encounters these adversarial observers, we want it to avoid this, this risk accumulation from those adversarial observers. And this is a little bit different than other types of risk-aware planning. Sometimes we think about risk-aware planning as a particular location in the environment is risky or hazardous. And instead, what we're thinking about here is we're thinking about these adversaries as being observers where accumulated uh, samples or accumulated observations of us could reveal our strategies, could reveal our targets. And so we're trying to protect either the locations of the targets or our underlying strategies um, from, from these, these risky observers. And to do so, 
we need to come up with a way to balance that information and risk. So we define some information dynamics that encodes our goals and targets, and we're going to write this as a fee function that is summation of the different locations of our targets, uh, and that can vary over time. So you can have uh, you can have moving information, you can have information that accumulates if we're not looking at it, and some depletion dynamics when we're within a certain range of of those locations that represent the data collection or information gathering from our agent. And of course, if it's just a static function that never um, replenishes, it's just a data harvesting. As soon as you add replenishment dynamics, then you can get towards persistent monitoring applications. And then these risk dynamics are the threats to the agent. So again, we're going to formulate this as some number of threats, and we're going to each model each threat with a different function. Um, in this case, uh, for this ICRA paper, we're using uh, sums of Gaussians, however, we can use different distributions or different models of risk. And we want to avoid risk accumulation from the agent. So again, instead of thinking about a particular location as being just a hazardous location, uh, what we're talking about is that if we're in the presence of these sources of risk for too long, that might reveal too much about our strategy or our targets. And so we write risk accumulation as a discounted sum over some horizon meaning that we take into account how much risk we've recently accumulated, and then based on our future actions, where, where might we go? Which can be you know, rather simply written as a maximize the information gathered and minimize the risk accumulated. And then we want to simultaneously optimize over both of these objectives, which we're going to do by looking at tools from um, Pareto Optimal op Observation. And so if you're not familiar with uh, Pareto style optimization, uh, first thing we need to do is we need to generate a Pareto front. And so for these two objective functions, we can generate a set of candidate trajectories. So you can set maybe RT, some other random tree search planner, and you can generate candidate trajectories for your agent, and you can score each of those trajectories based on your cost functions or your objective functions. And so for each of those candidate trajectories, we can evaluate both how much information we'd gather and how much risk we would accumulate along those trajectories. And then we can create our Pareto fund by finding those trajectories which are considered Pareto dominant. Uh, what we mean by that means that those are trajectories that either have uh, the most information gathered or the least risk accumulated. And in this case of these three sample trajectories, what we see is that two of them fall as uh, dominant trajectories, whereas one represents the most information gathered, one represents the least risk accumulated, and that middle trajectory neither gathers the most information nor does it accumulate the least amount of risk. And so it would not be along our Pareto front if we were to plot the you know, information gathered, risk accumulated across our Pareto front. So these candidate trajectories uh, populate our Pareto front, and then our goal is to choose from those set of trajectories along a Pareto front which one is the best one to take. And in this example, what we're plotting is at every point in time, we can generate candidate trajectories, we create this Pareto front, and then we're choosing which one to take based on a weighted optimization where we're going to weight the two objectives, that information gathered and risk accumulated, based on a dynamic weighting factor uh, on our risk accumulated. Which is to say that so long as we're not accumulating risk, or so long as our risk is at, at a low enough threshold, we should prioritize the information gathered. And then when we start to get into riskier situations, we're going to switch over to simply avoiding risk. And so we see this behavior as the agent moving between its information sources as the risk appears to it, it then moves out of the way and then goes back. This is a reactive planner. This is not thinking about you know, strategies or doing a lot of planning um, on behalf of the risk agent. This is simply reacting to risk as it evolves. And why we chose to do it in this reactive way is because the agent may not have a lot of global information about the risk that it finds. It may only be discovering these uh, risky observers as they come nearby. And so again, 
we can actually write out that there is some notional upper bound of risk. You can think about if you accumulated uh, the maximum amount of risk over a trajectory, uh, then we have some upper bound on risk. And if we make a few assumptions about the convexity of those functions locally over our planning horizon, as well as how quickly the agent can move compared to the risk observers, we can uh, guarantee that we stay below our maximum bounds of risk under this way, but that does assume a lot um, about, about the risk that we're taking on. And in the interest of time, I won't go into detail about these proofs, but essentially what this weighted alpha is doing is it's saying we're going to pursue information until it's too risky to switch over to avoiding risk. And under this, we can break our assumptions about how quickly the agent can move relative to the risk, and we still see that the agent is able to keep the risk where we're, here we're plotting that alpha value um, to show that we actually never reach an alpha value of one, which would mean we only care about risk. And so we're always dodging these risky observers uh, to keep our risk accumulation below our desired thresholds. Um, we also discuss in our paper the kind of how do you generate those candidate trajectories, how do you search for those policies? And that really depends on how much, how much you know about your system or what assumptions you can make. So if you have limited information about your targets, maybe you don't have the full, um, maybe it's not nice Gaussian peaks that model your information, uh, maybe you have limited observations about the risk agents or knowledge of, of where they are, you might perform a dense tree search and evaluate your ca candidate trajectories in that way. And so if you're doing a dense tree search, doing a very random sampling of the ways that you can go, uh, you see that maybe the trajectories have this random noise in it, but we can still move between our different information peaks and our objectives. Uh, but let's say you know a little bit more about the problem structure. Maybe you do have a nice Gaussian model of uh, modeling those information densities as Gaussian, modeling those risk agents as Gaussian, which gives you nice locally convex gradients. Um, then what, what we propose is, uh, it turns out if you think about the way the information peaks are and the risk peaks are, we're always going to seed our search with one branch that follows the gradient of either maximizing information or minimizing risk. And if we do that, we get much more directed performance. So you can see the trajectory start to smooth out. Um, and, and so this is taking advantage maybe of knowledge that you have about the problem structure. But if you don't have that knowledge, then you might. <laughs> is it? It's coming back. It's coming back, OK. Yeah. Sorry, I don't, I don't know what's, what's happening. I think it was out here. So, um, so this is uh, just some things we're, we're thinking about with this. And, and again, kind of the takeaways. So what we're really interested in this is we're interested in this idea of using multi-objective optimization to start to balance kind of competing ideas and have this trade-off of should I pursue information? Should I avoid this risky behavior? and using tools from um, you know, multi-objective optimization, we can get more complex agent behavior in these systems without necessarily having to do like decision trees or other types of heuristics. But this is only kind of the beginning of this problem. What we're really interested in is how do we think about active adversaries? How do we think about the adversaries that are pursuing the targets, how do maybe we combine some of this type of planning with our game theoretic planning? So, yeah. Uh, and, and really, um, kind of why I included in today's talk is thinking about the ways in which we can model complex interactions using tools for multi-objective uh, optimization is a way to start to get to our agents to exhibit 
different behaviors depending on the types of in agents or interactions that they're having um, within the environment. And I think due to uh, the time limits, I will maybe just spend five minutes talking about this and run a little bit over on time. Um, but the final thing I was going to talk about today is heterogeneous multi-robot resource delivery. And so in this problem, what we're thinking about is thinking about how teams of robots can deliver resources within an environment, but specifically we have that every robot has different supply capacities, the resources can evolve over time, and we're starting to think at how we scale this up to lots of agents over large areas, meaning that we want to avoid centralized solutions. We want to be able to quickly replan and quickly redeploy our, our teams. So the demand of resources evolving, the locations of that demand appearing are happening in such a way that we can't assume an offline centralized task planner is appropriate to, to do this. Um, and because it's late in the day and I think it's always fun to come back to maybe oddball or curveball examples, I'm going to say this matters for raccoons. <laughs> and uh, so one example I think about is imagine you're trying to deploy wildlife vaccines. This is a real problem that we have. And uh, there's this really nice wired article that you can check out about a campaign to airdrop tiny rabies vaccines to raccoons all across the eastern seaboard. This is a real thing. Why? Rabies worldwide ki kills about 60,000 people annually. In the US, rabies now is predominantly a wild life disease. We've done a great job of vaccinating our household pets, uh, but there's still a lot of rabies in wildlife populations. And so the US Department of Agriculture deploys 9 million of these vaccine bait traps annually across the eastern seaboard. And what we can show from different population studies is that if you can get 30% of the local raccoon population vaccinated, that'll stop the spread of rabies in that area. And 60% is enough to eliminate rabies from that population. The problem is, is that, you know, you, you don't, while you can survey raccoon populations, uh, it's not like you know where all these raccoons are over time. You don't know if they carry rabies. And the bait traps that they're deploying are the size of a quarter. So how are they doing this currently? It's not with drones. It's not with robots. And in fact, they're doing this with planes and helicopters uh, flying low over rural and urban areas. <laughs> And to me, as a roboticist, this sounds like a really inefficient use of planes and helicopters. And maybe, given the size and scale, we can start to think about moving this to drones, moving this to ground robots that could be a little bit more agile than trying to get pilots in the air with helicopters and planes to deliver these bait traps that are the size of a quarter. So we're going to think about this heterogeneous multi-robot resource delivery uh, in the context of delivering different wildlife vaccines, and maybe different animal types uh, take different types of bait. So we know that the rabies vaccine for raccoons also works for skunks, but if you're talking about bats, it's a different rabies vaccine that you want to deploy. And we want to do this in a way such that we can quickly and efficiently scale this out over our robots. Those robots can only carry a finite supply on, on board. And where that demand of these resources is, is going to change over time. So we want to be able to quickly adapt to the different locations of, of, the, uh, of the agents. And again, so this, this evokes a lot of related work in dynamic task allocation, in different monitoring, routing, and scheduling problems, as well as in heterogeneous coverage control. And what I'll show, maybe just to kind of Go, go quickly through this. Um, what we have is we're going to take a, a geometric or coverage-based policy to this, which is that in traditional Voronoi-based coverage control, we would move our agents around to optimally cover some common distribution. And we can take this for multiple resources and deploy, deploy this across um, the full teams, and we can actually use multiple Voronoi tessellations and a combined uh, CBF-CLF approach to solving for that to 
follow these different resources, and this is much more efficient than doing things like some type of lawnmower or other persistent pattern where you're not adapting to the changes in demand over time. And what our most recent work has started to look at is how can we respond to discrete events coming up and still use these Voronoi tessellations to respond to discrete events. And in that way, as we start to think about responding to discrete events with this heterogeneous team, uh, bringing it back to the theme of cooperation, how can we adapt to variations among the team? So if we have robots that are just not able to serve as many events as other robots or are not working as well, how can we readjust those boundaries and that allocation of tasks um, to better serve and improve the group efficiency? And so in this video, what we see is we have the different robots with their different resources, and these events are coming up that those robots must serve. Uh, and as we can see in this video, we have one robot in the corner, which is much slower than the other robots. And so we start to see an accumulation of unserved tasks appear um, for that robot. And so the question is, is how do we then balance balance that among the team. And so we introduce in our recent work this notion of um, defining reputation. And I think this is the music playing me off the stage. And so we start to look at the number of events met versus assigned. And we can assign a reputation that then we can use to adjust the boundaries. Um, and it turns out by embedding this reputation, we'll take those lower performing robots, give them smaller cells, give those tasks to the other robots and improve the performance of our team. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of these in more detail during the coffee break. I just wanna conclude and say uh, thank you to the many collaborators on the works discussed in this paper and thank you uh, for listening. <laughs>